Hello, and welcome to today's event. My name is Brenda Holt, and I'm the Associate State Director of Community Outreach for the Arizona State Office of AARP. We are the nation's largest nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to empowering people 50 and older to choose how they live as they age. With a nationwide presence and nearly 38 million members across the nation, and over 900,000 right here in Arizona, AARP strengthens communities and advocates for what matters most to families, such as health security, financial stability, and personal fulfillment. During the month of September, we will be focusing on thriving in the job market, where we will showcase ARP's relevance as a wise friend and a fierce defender, helping workers find a job while fighting on their behalf against ageism. We will provide tips, advice, and resources to help you stay competitive in today's job market and to mitigate the impact that the coronavirus pandemic has had on employment and income. Navigating today's ever-changing job market can be tough, but we're here to help you through it. Please visit us at aarp.org backslash work for tips, tools, and resources on how to stay competitive in the job market. You can also visit us at aarp.org backslash az to find out other activities and events that are being provided by the Arizona State Office. Again, we'd like to thank you for joining us today, and we hope you enjoy this event. Well, hello, good evening, everyone. I want to welcome you to Arizona History Happy Hour. So glad you can join us tonight as we're getting ready for some major fun right here at 7 o'clock hour here in the lovely sunny Arizona. So I want to welcome everybody who's on this evening. Now, I know some of you are going to be watching on Facebook, some of you are going to be watching on YouTube, and some of you are going to even be watching on Twitch. I mean, can you look at that? It's already into September. That's just kind of shocking that it's already that late. So today we're celebrating all kinds of things. So, um, so actually tomorrow in Arizona history, back in 1936, Francisco Hernandez, who was a Tucson stonemason, passed away. He helped build the old courthouse, the Carnegie Library, which you can see right there, the St. Joseph Academy, and even the first structure on U of A's campus. Now, there's all kinds of things we're celebrating today, including Tester's Day. And at first, when I saw the, I was like, testers, I was like, oh, they're looking at computer bugs and things like that. But actually, this goes back to 1947 when they were working on a computer that was having issues and they found an actual bug in the computer. It was a moth that was shorting out some solenoids and causing that calculator not to work properly. Also, since 2000, we are now celebrating weirdo one wonderful weirdo day so for all of you weirdos out there hello how are you nice to see you it takes one to know one so this started back in 2000 out in austin where kind of their theme is keep austin weird some folks felt that they should I guess, appreciate more the people than what they were doing so that's how this got started it is also National Sudoku Day, which actually started off back in the 1890s as a puzzle. It then became so popular in Japan in the 80s, and now you can find books of it everywhere you go. Now, it is also National Teddy Bear Day, 
And that dates back to former President Theodore Roosevelt. On this day back in 1902, was out and refused to shoot a bear cub. That There was a cartoon drawn of that that went everywhere. It got so popular that someone decided, you know, let's make a toy of that. And they actually even asked Theodore Roosevelt if they could borrow his name. And that's how we got the teddy bear. So what can you expect this evening? Well, you know, we're going to have lots of fun. We always do trivia. We've got some music history. We've got a little bit of show and tell. We talk about a small town. We have a cocktail, of course, or a beverage, depending on. But today it is indeed a cocktail, as well as a special guest. So if this is your first time here, you might be wondering, who is that man and why is he on my screen? Well, my name is Marshall Shore. I got to Arizona actually via Brooklyn. I was working in a beautiful Carnegie building, but I got tired of the blistering cold in the winter, that snow that would turn to slush and decided it was time for a change. So traded that for a 1950 library in South Phoenix. And when I got there, there was this rich oral tradition of the community. And that was one of the things that got me going on what I'm doing today. They are now in a pretty spanky, spank a new library, which is pretty nifty. And to do all that, we had to load everything into a U-Haul, a big orange cube. And you know, the World International Headquarters are right here in the Valley of the Sun. Now, when we got here, we promptly moved into a 1956 ranch. Now, originally it was oh so many tones of beige. I'm happy to say now it is a lovely, much more simplified two, count them, one, two tone, seafoam and cantaloupe. The house is pretty much a time capsule. That's what my kitchen looks like today. All that buttercream yellow tile, the push buttons for the matching stovetop inset in the wall, and even a an GE electric oven with no window that makes it a little bit more difficult to bake a cake in. Now, as soon as I got here, all I kept hearing about how there was no history. But, you know, every time I decided that I was going to leave the house, whether it was on foot, on my bike, in a car, I kept running across so many amazing people, places, and stories. And so that really got me thinking there is indeed so much history here. And then there's that post-war boom. All those GIs that either were stationed here, trained here, or passed through on the way to somewhere else. And after the war, they were moving here in huge numbers, and in some cases looking for a house just like mine. Now, I'm also known as the hip historian, which means I get to have fun with all kinds of history. Now, if any of your ARP members, I know I just got in my mailbox in the state section, there's a little article about what we're doing right now. Getting a chance to do Arizona History Happy Hour as we get it, as we talk about Arizona history. Kind of a variety show of history. I've also, we have walking tours. Actually, the first one of the season is coming up this Saturday. And then we've got a couple more coming up on the 2nd and 9th of October. You can find out more information on hiphistorian.com. And then as of today, there is now a bus tour on October 23rd. Now, it's an early one. We're starting at noon, but it's actually going to be really cool. So... It should be a lot of fun. And then we're working on getting a program up called Beyond the Grave, honoring our ancestors, which will actually take place in the Pioneer Cemetery, right down near the Capitol. So that's gonna be really a, an interesting event. And also in November, we are kicking off an LGBT plus voices storytelling workshop that we got sponsorship through the Phoenix Office of Arts and Culture. So we're gonna be rolling that out fairly soon. So if you know anybody who's interested, please turn them on to it. And also, I think actually later this month, 
if the dates don't lie, I may wind up with an Emmy for sharing some Arizona history, which I think is pretty cool. So we shall see how that goes. I did just find out I can get a certificate that says I was nominated for an Emmy. So I'm going to be doing that as well. Now, remember, there is the chat session off to the side of the screen. Now, if you remember something that you wish you had said, you know, you can always reach out to me on Facebook, Instagram, email. It's all good. And I love to hear from all of you because, you know, that's really where I get my best stories is that's why I started doing all this because with the way the world is going right now, everything was canceled over a year ago. All the tours I was doing, all the lectures, and I was sitting in my house all alone, not sharing stories and nobody was sharing stories with me. So that's why I started doing this as a way to share more stories across the, the state. Now I will ask if you are watching on Facebook, there is a little share button down there. If you can click on that, I sure would appreciate it. Now, you know, I talk about being from New York, but I grew up in a little tiny town in Indiana of about 25 people and then moved myself to New York. And so I have this special affinity for small towns and Arizona has a lot of those small towns. And so today we're gonna talk about a little town I, I'm sure I've driven through, didn't even know what I was driving through at the time. So Claypool, Arizona, it's in Gila County. It has just under 1,200 residents, was established back in 1917. Now it's named Claypool for a young man who got here in the 1890s and was kind of, he originally was gonna get into mining, but decided that he kind of outgrew that mining and decided to get into the development side, which he did. And if you ever make your way through Claypool, it's actually, you can see it is smack dab in the middle between Miami and Globe. I'm sure I've driven right through it and didn't even realize I was driving through a different town. So I need to watch better. And so if you drive through, you'll be able to, or stop, you'll be able to see an 18, 80s train depot. There's even some early 1900 storefronts still standing. But you know, it used to take a lot of time to get from Miami to Superior. And so they built what they called the million dollar highway because of the cost and it was also using labor from the prison camp near Superior. And so when it opened, it was all these curvy, windy roads. And then they decided that they should build the Claypool Tunnel. And so they dynamited right through the mountain and built this tunnel. They then enlarged it in the early 50s, just in time to close it down and it could, so it could be replaced then by the Queen Creek Tunnel. But when it was built, it was the largest tunnel in Arizona. And some say it's one of the earliest tunnels still surviving that haven't been torn down or blown up. Now, when they did that remodel on the tunnel, they actually put a plaque on it to signify that this was indeed part of that million dollar highway. And then it was replaced by the Queen Creek Tunnel. But you know, you can't discount and say that other tunnel the Claypool Tunnel doesn't exist because now you can go for a hike right through the middle of it. So that's what I'm looking forward to doing when the weather cools down. I'm going to make my way down to Claypool and go. And I see Pam used to live there. Oh, and you know, and what's really interesting is um, they recently noticed that this plaque had gone missing. So if anyone sees this plaque around, please let somebody know either in a dot or someplace so that we can get it back where it goes. Now they said to get it off, it had been attached really well. So it took someone a lot of effort and time to get that plaque off of the Claypool tunnel. 
they are looking at redoing the plaque based, I think, actually on this photo. So hopefully they get that done soon so we can, because we don't have enough plaques on things. But that's just a personal high horse. All right. So, you know, it indeed would not be a happy hour without a libation of some sort. And I am lucky enough to actually have PJ Vader Baron as kind of my cocktail advisor. And so he actually is in Puerto Rico this week. So we are having a mojito. And so I went over the Valley Ho and got my mojito. Oh, and I love that the green screen is picking up the, <laughs> the leaf, <laughs> the mint in my mint julep. So it's got a little bit of mint, some white rum. They also threw a little dash of some 32 year aged dark rum in there. A lovely lemon wedge, club soda. Very, very refreshing. All right. So now we get to the fun part of the show. If you weren't having fun already, just you wait. So we always have a special guest on, and tonight is no exception to that. We have Justin Levine. So welcome to the screen, Justin. So happy you can join us this evening. Oh, hello, Marshall. Thanks for inviting me. Great to be here. Oh, indeed. I mean, you're a longtime friend, a music lover. You founded Vintage Phoenix on Facebook. I did. And so you have, I mean, every time we meet, I always learn something from you. So when I was going through my list of folks who I want to be on the show, it was like, Justin needs to be here because he will share stories that I've never heard. And some of the folks out there have never heard either. So. Well, uh, thank you. I mean, it's um, it's still amazing. Vintage the the Vintage Phoenix Facebook site. It's it's like it's over fifty thousand members now, and I think a week from tomorrow, September seventeenth, we're going to be celebrating our ten year anniversary. Oh my gosh! Um, if I would have known, I would have baked you a cake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, you know, um, I mean, it's fun. It, uh, I didn't really expect it to to be anything. I, I uh, it's kind of a long story about how it got created, but I, I sort of initially created it in order to get people off my back because they were complaining on the Legend City page that I had originally created that they couldn't discuss stuff that wasn't related to Legend City. It kept deleting their things. <laughs> and so it's like, all right, but this is cool stuff. So we're going to, you know, I'm going to create a new site. We're going to call it Vintage Phoenix. And anything old phoenix that doesn't include that also includes legend city but other stuff we can do and, and then uh i just you know i really just wanted to concentrate on building the legend city site so vintage phoenix sort of got spammed with with a you know a bunch of people like you know hawking their businesses that were in new york or whatever and, and then uh Finally, this uh, woman contacted me through Facebook named Joanne Downey and said, listen, if you'll allow me to be an administrator of the site, I'll clean up the, the spam and, and, like, you know, make it run properly. So there's, like, eight administrators now, and you know, including, like, uh, Christy Kennedy, who is, um, uh, she's a daughter of Ken Kennedy, who was uh, the original Gold Dust Charlie on Channel 5. If you're not familiar with Gold Dust Charlie... That's the like the forerunner to the Wallace and Ladmo show. It's like the character of Wallace originally started on Gold Dust Charlie and then got his own show and then Ladmo came in. Um, uh, but there's, it's, you know, Paul Berkmeyer and, and, and a bunch of other people, Tom and Candace and Mike, and none of these people I've ever met except for Christy Kennedy that, that basically run the site. And I, I just sort of, I was the one who started it and now it's grown into this, this resource that like, you know, uh, Phoenix journalists are always like popping on to do research or find out about things. So. Right. It, I, I know I use it myself looking for things. So. Yeah. It, it, it's amazing. It, it, it just, I started it on a lark 
and it grew into this amazing behemoth. So, so 10 years uh, on the 17th, it'll be amazing. <laughs> and I do want to commend you on that's an amazing jacket. No, oh, thank you. You are so welcome. Well, I, like I said, I, I knew, uh, you know, with uh, with Marshall Shore, there's always going to be competition. I, I couldn't let him, like, uh, outshine <laughs> me. So. Indeed. <laughs> so now, are you having a cocktail this evening? Uh, I am. Uh, thank you for reminding me. I, you know, I did not have time to go to the market today. And, and uh, so I did not have stuff for a mojito, but... If I can go off camera for two seconds to get the, the missing ingredient here, hang on. Uh oh, a secret missing ingredient. Yeah. How fun. So, you know, since PJ has been doing this for over a year, we've actually started talking about doing, I think we're gonna do a special show in December that may just focus on some of the amazing cocktails that is created. And it will hopefully, if we can pull it off, will be a in-person as well as a virtual thing. I will so absolutely my, be there. The the oh my God, I would love to have you there. Is uh, I, I've got this. I bought this new gizmo from Iceology. It, it creates perfectly clear ice, and this it creates these big like Mongo oh, two inch ice cubes. It's perfectly clear and fancy. tastes great. So hang on. A so there we go. We start off with that. Uh, I don't have full mojito stuff, but I've got the rum, so we'll start with the rum base here. <laughs> you know, how can you go rum, wrong with rum? Uh, that, and then, all right, I do not have mint leaves, but I do have peppermint schnapps. <laughs> It's 90 proof, so I gotta like be careful with this stuff. This is like, yeah, this is insane. that's probably too much. We'll see. I don't know. <laughs> At least your breath will be smelling fresh, yes. And then for a little, we'll, we'll throw in a little creme de mint as well, a little color. <laughs> so that we have a green screen, it would, pick up the, this, but... it would pick up the green in, in your cocktail and <laughs> make it your green screen, and then. Finally, to top, I don't have any garnish, but we'll top it off with a little uh, zero sugar. Uh, ah, sugar. nice. Very See, good. I, I have no idea what this is going to taste like, but <laughs> it's the closest thing to a mojito that I've got like in my cap. So. <laughs> Post out. Cheers. All right. Thank All right. Cheers. Watching in and listening. Tastes like mouthwash, but that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes when you try things, you never know which way it's going to go. Yeah. All right. So Justin has made some really amazing trivia questions. Now, you know what's unique about when we do trivia here is we go through the and we go through all the questions and the multiple choice answers. And then we will take a little bit of an Arizona music break that also is very Justin specific as well. And then we'll go through and talk about some of the, we'll talk about all the answers. Now you can keep track of your score on a notebook. Some people keep track actually in the chat session, whatever makes you happy, you go for it. It's all a good thing. All right. So, as we get ready for question one, ding. Oh, I was gonna bring a bell in. I forgot to bring a little bell. So that we could ring it whenever I felt like it. No, oh, fantastic. Do you, have, do you have one? Cause I got a bell also I can bring. Oh, it's in the other room. I'm not, I'm not gonna run over and grab my bell. So I'll make that on my list for next week. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so our first question what was the name of the bar located in the basement level of Chris Town, which is, oh, Roger says, ding. Thank you, Roger. <laughs> so what was the bar located in the basement level of Chris Town, now Spectrum Mall, underneath the shops on the main level? Was it A, the Cavernous Tavern, B, the Gender's Closet, C, Chris Town Pub, or D, Grog's Lair? So which do you think one of those was the name of a bar located 
under Chris Town Mall in the basement. All right. So as you're figuring that out, we are going to go on ahead and move to question two. Folk musician Joe Benthancourt was for 17 years at which establishment? Was he at A, JD's, B, The Rhythm Room, C, Funny Fellows, or D, Biltmore Fashion Park? So Joe Bethencourt was a musician and he was playing where for 17 years. Oh, I see Justin's, you're adjusting your cocktail. Yeah, I'm topping it off. <laughs> just, just with the, 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 yeah. just the ginger. All right, so question three. What Phoenix TV show aired old sci-fi horror and monster movies every Saturday morning on KPHO TV5? And it ran for nearly a quarter of a century from 1964 to 1988. 1030 was, to noon. Indeed. Was it A, Dr. Wizard's De Desert Terrors? Was it B, The Walls and Ladmo Show? Was it C, TV5's Mystical Journeys? Or D, The World Beyond? So what one of those was a long time show on KPH Channel 5 and they showed sci-fi and horror and monster movies every Saturday morning. All right, moving on to question four. Which of the following reasons make the Phoenix Suns unique among NBA franchises? A. Only team to have played more than one triple overtime game in the NBA Finals. B, the only team never to have won an NBA championship among team franchises, franchises over 30 years old. C, the first team to have a mascot based on a real animal. Or D, only sportscast announcer in the NBA to have worked more than 45 consecutive seasons. All right. So which one of those do you think makes the Phoenix Suns unique among all the other NBA franchises? Ah, oh, this is going to be a fun one. Which of the following accurately described tennis player Bobby Riggs' connection to Arizona. He was once head coach of the now defunct Phoenix Rackets team in the World Tennis League. B, he was a minority owner of the Greyhound Racing Park. C, he was occasionally seen giving out free sugar daddy candy bars in the upper rafters of the Veterans Coliseum over at the fairgrounds. Or D, he was once arrested for public indecency at the Playboy Club on Central Avenue. Oh my gosh, what could he have done? All right. <laughs> so one of those accurately describes a famous tennis player, Bobby Riggs, and his connection to Arizona. He was the number one ranked player for uh, 1946 and 1947. Number one in the world. Well, and also famous for Battle of the Sexes. Yes, a, 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 a famous uh, tennis tournament between himself and Billie Jean King. He's boasting that, you know, men could always beat women in that game. And Billie Jean King challenged them with big... Uh, big well-to-do back in the, the 70s. It was a huge to-do. And so, all right, so moving on to question six. What Phoenix-based band had a hit single in 1964 entitled Work, Work? And Alice Cooper cites them as a direct influence on his work and his lengthy career. All right, was it A, Vincent Furnier and the Spiders? B, Commander Candelo's Salt River Navy Band? C, Barry and the Goldwaters? 
or D, hubcap and the wheels. So which one of those bands was an influence on Alice Cooper and also was a hit single back in 1964? All right, question seven. Star Wars opened on just 32 screens on May 25th of 1977. By July 31st, it was playing, of 1977, it was playing on 956 theaters throughout North America. How many of those were right here in Arizona? Was it A, one, B, three, C, seven, or D, 12? So how many screens was it play, was Star Wars playing on right here in Arizona? All right, question eight. How was Don Bowles murdered in June of 1976 after reporting on land fraud schemes by local contractors? A, he was gunned down by an assassin outside the entrance to Legend City Amusement Park. B, he had his porterhouse clandestine poisoned while eating at Durant Steakhouse. C, he had his car bombed in front of the Clarendon Hotel. Or D, strangled at night near the 18th hole at the Arizona Biltmore Golf Course. So which one of those ways was Don Bowles' demise? All right, moving on. What Phoenix restaurant had a medieval themed miniature golf course next door before closing in the early 1980s? A, Shady Acres, B, Green Gables, C, Beef Eaters, or D, Swords and Stuff. So one of those restaurants had a miniature golf course right next to it that was medieval themed. All right. Question 10. Built in 1979 on part of the land occupied by Legend City Amusement Park, Compton Terrace was Phoenix's first amphitheater built for rock and roll concerts. Which music star's father was part owner of Compton Terrace? Was it A, Alice Cooper, B, Linda Ronstadt, C, Warren Zevon, or D, Stevie Nicks? All right, so those are our 10 questions. But you know what? We've got a couple bonus questions for you. Bonus. I know. It's like I wish there were fireworks shooting off right now. Yeah. All right. So, question 11 Big Surf Water Park in Tempe, Arizona, first opened in October of 69. Which best describes Big Surf? A. It was the second inland wave pool park ever built. Oh, Sam, I see Roger's now putting up fireworks. See? <laughs> I knew special effects person. Oh, my gosh. Okay. B, it was the first amusement park to ever receive an award by the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. Or C, it was the first amusement park to ever receive an award in recognition of its safety record and avoiding fatalities. Ooh, what does that say about other amusement parks? <laughs> All right, D, it was a filming location for the 1987 cult surfing film, North Shore. Or E, it was a concert location for The Who on their 72 tour to promote their masterpiece album, Who's Next? Or could it be F? all of the above oh so now you got to put your thinking caps on yeah. and take a look does which one of those best describes big surf 
Was it one of them? Could it be all of them? Ah, oh, only- tough. Indeed, I know. Who and wrote you? My them? gosh. I hope I, I remember mean- the answers. <laughs> All right, and then our last and final question, question 12. Phoenix's Sombrero Playhouse opened back in 1947 as a stage and dinner theater. Now in 49, they added a movie screen. Which of the following statements about the Sombrero Playhouse is false? Which is false. Which is false, so that means not true. Got it. (laughs) <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right. A. Once hosted a live performance by Groucho Marx. B. Hosted the 1962 world premiere of playwright William Ng's Natural Affections before hitting Broadway. C. It was one of the first 20 theaters to show the Rocky Horror Picture Show at midnight. D, it was acquired by AMC Theaters due to impending bankruptcy. Or is it E, none of the above? Ah, you know, I had a professor in college that did that, made all these if and then things, and uh, (laughs) you had to know your stuff or you you were going to get it wrong. Yeah. All right. So that while you're thinking the about A, B, 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 A, C, A, there's like a, a, a regular formula for these. Uh, when you throw in an E, it's like it screws it Right. Off. And it kind of throws it off because if we're doing the bubble, I don't, I don't even think the bubbles went to E. So yeah, they would, that, been, right. yeah. So they would have been really confused. All right. So while everybody's out there thinking about all those answers, We are going to move on and do a little bit of an Arizona music history break. And so we are going to talk about a group that actually Justin introduced me to, Basic Elements. Now, they are likely the greatest 80s band you've never heard of. Now, except for a few folks who grew up here in Phoenix. Now... They were really kind of hot from 1984 to 1990. With that crowd that loves their Aquanet and new wave music. So they made a name for themselves in the 80s, playing many local venues with such bands as the Gin Blossoms, Gentlemen After Dark, Caterwaller. They opened up for some other even larger groups like Bolshoi and Gene Loves Jezebel. This was all while maintaining average grades, or, or, I'm sorry, while they were all 17 years old, still in high school. They couldn't even go to the venues they were playing. I can't speak about their grades, but I did go to high school with them. <laughs> well, did, uh, well, no, you know, actually, I, I didn't see anything that said they graduated, but I'm assuming they graduated. As far as I know, yeah. <laughs> I actually captured their first live performance uh, on videotape at the Shadow Mountain High School uh, talent show. Oh, wow. Oh, so also it's kind of like a, a thing, kind of like with Alice Cooper, starting off with a talent show in high school. Now, there you go. I, I wish I had had a video camera for that, boy. <laughs> oh, yeah, that would have been something. So, yeah, so, I mean, they played venues like the Mason Jar, the Fairgrounds, and pretty much any teenager whose parents were out of town for the weekend, they could be found playing at the party in that backyard. Now, sadly, they decided to break up in the 90s, and actually in 1990. They did a huge reunion concert in 2019 in L.A. at the Mint to a packed house. I was and, there, even though I do not see myself in that uh, image on the right there. I know. I, I actually kept looking for you in some of those photos that I found. <laughs> I was like, I, I didn't see you. I was like, because you weren't wearing that jacket. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be easy to spot. See, now you see Method of My Madness. Yes. <laughs> and so after this event, they went off and recorded not 
new music, but actually music they had written back in their heyday. And so it's 80s music now brought to life today. Yeah, they composed some great songs that they they never like recorded professionally. And um, my understanding is that they sent a demo tape to um, one of, I, I hope I'm telling this correctly, it's one of the producers of the Psychedelic Furs. Indeed, uh, yeah. Albums. Ed, yeah. Ed, Ed, Ed Bueller. Yeah, who, who took them on and um, uh, produced, uh, I'm not sure if they have a full album, but, but they have at least four singles, maybe more. Uh, and it might, you know, I would love to hear a full album from them someday, but it's, it's great. For those who, who love uh, new wave 80s music, it's, it's sort of like this undiscovered gem that, that, it, it, that, uh, that you, you know, has just been unearthed again because they only recently re released their professionally produced singles this past year. And it's, it's just amazing stuff. Yeah, and I know they've, they've done some Facebook Live things. So if you look them up on Facebook, you can track down and see some of the performances. And and so, they too made the mistake of having me host their uh, their live chat. So <laughs> I, I, I don't. <laughs> I, I'm like the the, the Forrest Gump of these uh, <laughs> these reunion shows. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So now I hope you're all ready for some answers because we've got some great ones for you. All right. So the name of that basement bar at Chris Town was called? The Janitor's Closet. So what was so special about the Janitor's Closet? Because everyone who talks about it gets like all misty eyed. What was so special about it from my perspective as a kid who was too young to ever go in there before it closed was the fact that it was in the basement of this huge mall where like families went and then it's like there was this sort of like secret stairway that you would go down and with a sign saying you know adults only when you know kids couldn't let and then it was sort of like if you're if, if you're old enough to remember uh like the early days of cable with on TV and, and when on went off the air, the Playboy channel would start, but the, the, the picture was scrambled. So oh, you'd sort of like right. stare at it for hours, hoping to, to get like a, a one second unscrambled uh, quick view of nudity. It was sort of like that you, you would go down the stairs and just hope to see somebody open the door so you could like peek in and this is like it, it like one in the afternoon and so there must have been like some hardcore like drinkers and alcoholics and you, you'd get in there and you'd see this sort of smoke filled people sitting at the bar with their you know and you know and, and meanwhile you, you're, you're like looking down the stairwell into it but meanwhile at, at the main level of chris town there's you know the the family kids toy store and the you know and the, and the bookshop and the, the pet store where you could play with the puppies and the little playpen and it was just it, it it just seemed like this other world that i was that all the kids were like not allowed to go into it was really and i uh, apparently based on like old like classified ads that i'd read i, I, I guess it stayed open till at least one in the morning but I, I mean, I always wondered like how that operated because all of, of course, with all the mall. Right, the mall would shut down. So like sometimes most would shut down like at nine at the latest, you know, okay, occasionally you could go to the movie theater and it would let out at like, you know, 10 or, you know, 1130 at the latest for, for the late show. But then it's like, I always wondered, it's like if, if you left the mall, could you walk it? I, you know, usually it would shut down. So when you left the mall, you could leave the mall, but you couldn't get back in because the doors were right. Like exactly. Behind. Yeah. But it's like if you tried to get in, I, I was never sure. Like if you tried to get in at midnight, and it's like the janitor's closet would be the only thing in the mall that would be open for like, you know, the late night crowd. 
I presume, I mean, I, I presume it must have been opened in, uh, until 1 a.m. each night. I, it just would make no sense to open a bar that would close at 9 or 10. But Right, exactly. Just people are starting to get raucous. And... Yeah, and unfortunately, as with a lot of, of stuff regarding Chris Town, there's uh, precious few actual photographs. Or there's no video that I've ever seen. Um, you know, closed in, in the era before, you know, home video. So it's sort of taken on this, uh, this mythic semblance, you know, in, in. Oh, very much. So. Um, and, you know, for people my age, I was of the age where I got caught where I was just about to turn uh, 18 uh, when they changed the drinking laws to make it 21. Okay. Right. So I never really experienced uh, sort of the bar culture of Arizona because I, I moved away from Phoenix by, <laughs> by, by that time. Um, but I know that, that Phoenix had a vibrant sort of bar culture and bar community um, before a lot of the other other culture sort of cropped up in the city, it was <laughs> right. There wasn't there, much else to do, um, right. and we were famous for dive bars. Oh, so yeah, many exactly. Bars. And 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 the, you know the the the, the few glimpses that I got, you know, behind the door, that I could just see like the first ten feet into by by just looking down that stairwell. Uh, you could tell it was just a classic, you know, dark mahogany wood bar with with the the stools on you know and and just hardcore functioning alcoholics there all day you know <laughs> and, while the rest of the world shopped above you know above their heads it was, it was so i yeah i wish i could have gotten a drink there but so and roger says that there were out there was an outside entrance is that right? The, from the outside? It, it, from that, that like, wow, no one's ever, no one, I mean, it makes sense, but no one's ever talked about the outside. I, I mean, from the, from a fire code standpoint alone, I would have to imagine that, that that stairwell inside wouldn't be the only exit. But I, I never knew about it, yeah. Well, and then I've, all, I've also actually asked um, management of Spectrum if there's any, any, any of it left, because I'm sure the space is still there. Yeah. It, is the bar still there or is it now just an empty storage and i've gotten no response from them huh. so i mean they're getting ready to start approaching a huge redevelopment so we shall see what may, maybe i'll get a chance to get down there who knows yeah there's um there's a website i th I, I think i sent you the link that has a couple of photographs and it has like the top of the stairway entrance from from the far side so you can see but um yeah, it's one of those things that just it it's really only in the imagination. So it's taken on a more <laughs> mythic proportion. Right. Uh, very, very much so. All right. Folk musician Joe Benthancourt was for 17 years at which establishment? Funny fellows. Ah. Another establishment that, that there was precious few uh, photos or documentary evidence of, but I, I remember the logo of it was sort of similar to one of those funny face like emojis with it is a yellow face with the it wasn't uh -huh. a smiley face but it was open like eh, you know with the tongue hanging out, um, and it served sandwiches and my parents used to take me there on rare occasions. I was really really young. And the first time I went there, they opened the door and there was this guy uh, with, it was the first time I'd ever seen a getup like this, like a full, like one man band outfit. He had like the big, uh, um, like drum, bass drum strapped to his back. And he had like these wire things with a kazoo here and a harmonica here. Uh, and then there, and he had like, a trumpet strapped here and a saxophone strapped here and he had a banjo uh, and he had like every instrument known to man like strapped to him except for maybe a keyboard uh, and it turned out this guy was Joe Bethencourt. Yeah. Uh, and he would, you know, play at this restaurant that basically 
just had sandwiches. Um, for 17 years, he was sort of like the house musician. And I remember, I, I mean, I, I don't remember distinctly <coughs> enough to remember like what song he played, but he, I mean, he, he played every instrument like expertly. Wow. And you know, he's also in the Arizona Music Hall of Fame. Indeed. Yeah. And so I yeah, mean, if you if you do like a YouTube search for him, you can you can see a, a bunch of his performances. Really, um, and unher even though he's in the Arizona Hall of Fame, still I, I think uh, an underrated, unheralded musician. The great Joe Bethencourt and the great Funny Fellows. All right. So what Phoenix TV show aired old sci-fi horror and monster movies every Saturday morning on Channel 5 and ran for nearly 25 years? The World Beyond from 10.30 to noon. Yeah, I um, just for those who don't know me, and that's basically everybody, uh, I, I grew up, I spent, spent my whole childhood in Phoenix, grew up there until I was uh college age and i went to tucson and then i moved out to los angeles so i really only spent my childhood and teenage years in phoenix and you know so i only spent maybe like a year and a half of those years being able to drive and again they changed the drinking laws right so i wasn't able to visit the bars so um most of my history of phoenix was spent watching television and going to movies frankly um but Beyond uh, the Wallace and Ladmo show, which like every kid of the 60s, 70s, and 80s grew up on, uh, the world beyond was a regular staple on Saturday mornings. They'd have like the cartoons that every channel would put on. But then at 1030, uh, it, this was the show that really like triggered uh, my own passion about movies. It was like, it was both horror, sci-fi, and, and just monster movies like Godzilla and The Blob and Dracula, Frankenstein, blah, 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 you know. Uh, so it was every morning from 10.30 to noon. And then if I was feeling lazy and had nothing going on that Saturday, which was most Saturdays, uh, there would, it would be followed by Action Theater from 10.30 from uh, to 1.30, uh, which is like World War II movies and Westerns and Gunga Din style stuff. Um, but yeah, The Final World Beyond uh, aired June 25th, 1988. They showed uh, Destroy All Monsters, which is a, which is a Godzilla film that, that featured like Rodan and Mothra and, and Ghidra, the three-headed monster, and all of them in there. Um, and yeah, I used to watch that religiously and... and the, you know, I, I think that it was one of those shows that KPHO, which w back then was an independent station, right. not affiliated with the major networks. Uh, and they would be able to buy all these sort of monster movies from the 50s and 60s dirt cheap and just kind of throw them on there. Um, so, but it was a, it was a great blast. And, and the, the, the announcer was Stu Tracy, who was also, I think, the weather guy for, for Channel 5. Um, it, it, you know, I think uh, Facebook has a, a tribute page that it's called the World Beyond Tribute. And again, if you do a YouTube search, you can, uh, you can hear some of, like, Stu Tracy's announcements, like, coming up on next week, The Blob with Steve McQueen, you know, yeah, that, that kind of stuff. It, it's, it's, uh, but um, for those who grew up on television, as I did, Saturday mornings, yeah, The World Beyond. Couldn't miss it. It was great stuff. Okay, so if you watch that for the movies, did you ever see when Aquanetta and Jack would do their, like, midnight movies? I did not. No. Ah. I, um, okay. I don't know if it was because my parents just sent me to bed too early. Because I've always been a night owl. You know, so that would have been right up my alley. Um, but, you know, I actually, you know, back in those, back in those days, I guess this is, you know, this is Arizona history. So I guess I can say these <laughs> things. But this, this was when there was really only the three networks, ABC, NBC, CBS. And then KPHO TV5 was like the one independent station. And then you had the uh, Channel 8, which was the, the public broadcast station. 
And then eventually there was another independent station, Channel 15. But it was, it was you had to get it on the other, like, UHF versus VHS. Oh, uh, okay, style. great. Um, so Channel 5 was really the only independent station. And um, I think, uh, but they would all sign off, like, at midnight or 1 a.m. And you didn't have television between 1 a.m. and, like, I think maybe 6 a.m., maybe 5 a.m., except for, for one day out of the year, the Jerry Lewis Telethon. That's the one show that would run 24 oh, hours. Oh. Uh, it, was, it was on Labor Day weekend, so I thought it was like the coolest thing. I would stay up to, to watch TV at like 2.30 and 3 in the morning. And, and, you know, when Phoenix was still kind of a small town, just a, a desert community, and it's like, this is the greatest thing ever. I can watch TV at like three in the morning and, and see like some Vegas juggler. This is awesome. You know, they should, <laughs> every, every station should be 24 hours, you know, and then eventually that came to pass. And, but uh, right. yeah, so that's confessions of a, a TV addict growing up in Phoenix. But, uh, <laughs> like the Wallace and Ladmo show was, was the number one show that everybody watched. But uh, if you were, sort of a sci-fi geek you always watch the world beyond on channel five saturday mornings all right which of the following reasons make the phoenix suns unique among nba franchises they are the only team to have played more than one triple overtime game in the nba finals um, all right actually and should i play that video clip Yes, indeed. This, well, hang on a second. This will be, many people consider this to be the greatest game ever played in the history of the NBA. It is the Phoenix Suns versus the Boston Celtics, June 3rd, 1976, game five of the NBA Finals. It was played in Boston. So I got to stay up late my parents you know allowed me to stay up until uh, like 11 o'clock because it was triple overtime i it, back in boston it must have been like 1 a.m i can only imagine but right. uh yeah go, go ahead and roll the tape as they say all right celtics ahead by a point in the second overtime jojo white on the drive put it down and Suns trailing it by three points. John McLeod back to the drawing board. Crowd chanting defense. Lumpkin, Westfall, and Van Arsdale on the floor. Van Arsdale with a quick shot. It's a one-point game again. Just what Rick predicted. Westfall to the corner. Back to Van Arsdale. Perry in the air. Won't go. Oh, Perry again. Perry with a jump shot. Put it down. Phoenix has gone ahead. We've got five seconds. I don't believe it. I don't believe what I just saw down here. The Celtics. Sorry in the double overtime. Belichick touches it. It begins. Three seconds. Hondo off the glass. He's got it with a second. John Havlicek won it. It's over. Hondo has two seconds to go. The Boston Celtics. But the clock should have run out. Or did it have two? Right, two seconds. On the we were crushed. We thought Celtics had won. went in with two seconds to go. And the clock has to stop. <laughs> But no, the announcers are saying, no, it's still two seconds. So they give him back the one second. And Garfield Hurd makes the most amazing, like, shot within one second to send it into the triple overtime. It's 1-12, 1-12. Unbelievable sequence. First it was Havlicek. Then it was Garfield Hurd. Down to 21 seconds. It's a four-point lead. And McDonough lost it. 17 seconds, Silvers has got West Ball open. It's two points again at 12 seconds. Here is Glenn McDonald, two-point basketball game. Nelson gives it to Art. West Ball's got a hand on it. Art goes back, five seconds. White, four, three, two, one. It's going to be all over. And yeah, and that's, the, fans the Suns ended up still losing good. the game, and they, they lost. three overtimes. The, the finals, uh, they, you know, the end of that third overtime. Uh, they have never won a championship. The other game that went into triple overtime in the finals was versus the Bulls on March 29th, 1993. But the uh, the one versus the Celtics, game five, 
every Suns fan and even like, you know, casual people who weren't particularly basketball fans were just going nuts that night. Um, and that's really what sort of began, I think, the true love affair between the city of Phoenix and the Phoenix Suns. I forget which there was some uh, radio broadcast, sports broadcaster who said this recently. He's absolutely right. This is you can never really love a sports team until it breaks your heart first. Um, and and uh, the, the 76 uh, season was one of those where the Suns did so much better than everybody expected. And they came so close and yet couldn't couldn't quite get over the hump. But um yeah, even my mother was not, you know, a particular sports fan. I remember, you know, watching the game in my parents' bedroom, and she was like, after triple overtime, she was like, going nuts, and everybody was going nuts. So that game five of, of 1976, uh, yeah, ev- everybody goes to Phoenix will, re- will remember that night. So. <laughs> um, and, and the other answer is that um, the, they're act- with uh, – one of the answers that is not correct is that the Suns is as the only announcer to do more than 45 consecutive seasons. That's not true because Chick Hearn of the Lakers did more than 45. But Al McCoy of the Suns uh, eventually eclipsed his record, and he is now currently uh, the oh, longest wow. continuing announcer. I think he's on his. I I think he just wrapped up his 49th season. So it is the longest running basketball announcer in history, in NBA history. Okay. So I think he's like the only figure of the Phoenix Suns that I still have like a direct connection to. Uh, you know, and, and the Suns at this point, you know, because they've come so close like three times to winning the championship but not getting it, they've sort of become like what the Chicago Cubs were to Chicago before they the Cubs finally won their, their own, you know, World Series. They're, they... Everybody is just sort of waiting for them to finally win a championship because the Suns was the first professional sports franchise to get started in Phoenix. And it got started like, uh, I think, if not 69, the year I was born, maybe the year before at at most. I know it was like 68, 69 when they were actually playing down at the state fairgrounds in the Coliseum. Yeah, exactly. At the Veterans Memorial Coliseum. That's when all this took place. So it's like I remember seeing like, you know, Dick Van Arsdale, the very first player that the Suns recruited ever. You know, it, it, it's like it was great watching those guys be able to play. So, well, you know, and that is the perfect lead in to our next question. Oh, what's Wait on what? me. Oh, oh, there we go. All right. So, which of those following statements actually describes tennis player Bobby Riggs? And his connection to Arizona. He was occasionally seen giving out free sugar daddy candy bars in the upper rafters of the Veterans Memorial Coliseum. This uh, this was during, primarily during the Phoenix Rackets tennis games. Oh, okay. Which, which used to be like, there used to be like this World Tennis League, or I forget what it was called. And the, the, the Professional Tennis League was started by, in part by Billie Jean King's husband. Back in those days, she had a husband, believe it or not. So um, after Bobby Riggs had his famous like tennis match against Billie Jean King, he was sponsored by Sugar Daddy. And I guess just as a marketing ploy, they put him way up in like the nosebleed sections of the Coliseum and my dad was a huge tennis nut. He, so he had like season tickets to the Phoenix Rackets, uh, which got huge attendance because uh, the, the, the Rackets in a, in a huge coup managed to recruit Chris Everett, n- n- Chris Everett Lloyd. Now, oh, wow. But who was at the time, uh, without question, the, the best female tennis player in the world. I think you could arguably say at, the, at that time, like the, the best player, you know, regardless of gender, but it, and so sold a lot of tickets. So my parents would take me uh, to these games 
And I'd see this strange guy way up there with these, you know, thick horn rim glasses and sort of like this mop. I, I did like sandy blonde, brown hair. Like giving out candy. That they, it, and it's like, who's that guy? But and my parents said, oh, that's Bobby Riggs. Go see him. Um, and my parents were cool enough. And, and, and the era was such that, you know, they didn't, they didn't have to like grab my hand and take me. They, they just trusted me enough even though I was whatever, I don't know, seven, eight years old, it would, you know, to go up to the rafters and they were confident enough that I wouldn't like fall over the, <laughs> the railing to my death. Uh, and I'd go up, I didn't know who this guy was other than my parents apparently knew it was Bobby Riggs. Um, but a famous, like not only tennis player, but like gambler and hustler and, and, and like con guy, it was just a great character. But all I knew is the guy just handing out candy bars, and it's like, you know, hey, how's and it going? And, and he they were ended up candy bars. He, 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 most of the time, he'd give out regular sugar daddies. For whatever reason, he had a select few of the one-pound sugar daddy candy, candy bars, and he gave me one of the one-pounders. And again, mm -hmm. I'm like seven, eight years old, and so I'm like holding this thing at – you know, compared to my size, it's like half my size. Right, exactly. And at the time, again, when I was seven, eight years old, I didn't get the joke because I, I didn't know what sugar daddy meant, except that uh -huh. it was like a candy bar. Right. So I didn't get the fact that how appropriate it was for Bobby Riggs, of all people, to be sponsored by sugar daddy. Right. The whole battle of sex. I didn't sex know what it meant. Right, fact, exactly. A candy bar that had sugar in it. So... I trotted this like big, huge sugar daddy, you know, back to uh, the, the seats, huh? and uh, I it it stayed. I you know I was able to take a few bites. It was even back then it almost like broke my teeth off, and I kept it in my room for like four or five months, like occasionally like licking it or or taking a bite out of it and it would, it would it, it, there were sections that would like get like cat fuzz on it you know when, when i would for the you know after i exposed the the, the, the wrapper off of it and then right. i finally threw it out you know when it was like only a third of the way eaten after like six months <laughs> Um, but yeah, just as a promotion or yeah, I don't know if it was because of Billie Jean King put him up to it or maybe Sugar Daddy was paying him a boatload of money. He would just be up there. The guy, the, the former like number one tennis player in the world would be up in the nosebleed sections where there would only be a smattering of, of tickets sold just handing out candy bars to, to whoever would go up with him. It was great. <laughs> But yeah, Bobby Riggs, if you're not familiar with him, look him up. Great, great character. Indeed, that's why I, I, I was also thinking it was probably the Playboy Club. That he oh, got no, a, for the record, no. He was, as far as I know, he was never Right, exactly. That never, DC. that did not happen. <laughs> so in case anyone thought that that could have happened, it did yeah. not. All right, so question six. So what Phoenix-based band had a hit single, Work, Work, and Alice Cooper says that they were a direct influence on his music and his work and his career. Hubcap and the Wheels. Uh, front so five. who were Hubcap and the Wheels? They look kind of sketchy. They were sort of like the first, how would you describe it? Like before Spinal Tap, they were like the first parody band. Right. But... The, the thing is, much like Spinal Tap, they were genuinely good as musicians. So not everybody either, some people either didn't understand the parody or, or just didn't care. So they ended up like signing with Columbia Records and got a, a, a minor national hit with Work Work and got booked on like the Steve Allen show nationwide. Um, and Pat McMahon was sort of the the he was hubcap and he put on this ridiculous like pompadour wig and, and, and like you know a pound right, and of the bad, like, and the bad eyebrows and the eyebrows and everything yeah and but even though so he was sort of like 
the, the singer and the front for band, but the, 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 the actual musical heart of the band was this musician, Mike Candelo, um, who also went on um, to continue on with, with the Wallace and Labo show. Uh, the, his later band was uh, Car- Commodore Candelo's Salt River Navy Band, which I think was choice B. Right. So, uh, and he did like a lot of both parody songs and tribute songs, but he was an amazing musician in his own right. And if you go to the Museum of Musical Instruments um, in Phoenix, uh, there is what I assume to be a um, a permanent display uh, of Mike Candelo's work. It is. Uh, it's still there, right next to Alice Cooper. Oh, uh, that yeah, exactly, and, and very justifiably so. Just um, right. uh, very tragically, uh, took his own life in, in the nineties. Um, you know, I'm, I'm with the. I mean, I know how depression works, uh, so I'm not sure if it would have made the difference. But I, I got, you know, I, I, I don't think he ever really realized how many lives he touched and what an impact he had on the Arizona community. Uh, Mike Candela, look him up. Um, he's, he remains sort of a, a very revered cult figure in sort of late 60s psychedelic music circles um, right. and ended up on this great kids show, the, the Wallace and Ladmo show uh, in Phoenix. With, uh, so. But yeah, he, he, was, he's, he was sort of the inspiration to the, the forerunner of um, like bands like Spinal Tap. It was sort of this, this band that was sort of meant to parody these ridiculous sort of one hit wonder rock bands of the late fifties, early sixties. Right. And uh, yeah, ended up actually having a national hit and, and being on the Steve Allen show. So yeah, indeed. I, I would imagine you'd be able to, to find their footage on. on you can indeed find footage. Yeah. I, I, I almost thought about ending the show with one of their numbers, but my fear is always with copyright unless I can get actually like Pac-Man to say, yes, you can play that. No, I, I, I don't want to challenge anything. So I'm like, okay, you know, people just have to go on YouTube and take a search. <laughs> All right. So star Wars opened back in 1977. Oh, I didn't, I didn't add and on, on 32 screens across the country. Oh yeah. So uh, it, it opened uh, originally on 32 screens on May 25th, 1977. That, yeah. Yeah. We left that part out of the question. It, but when it originally opened, only opened on 32 screens. But uh, a couple of months later on July 31st, it was playing in 956 theaters throughout North America. Of those, how many of them were in Arizona, Marshall? One. One and only one. The original Seneca Pre on 24th Street and Camelback had exclusive rights in the entire state to this film that nobody that distributors didn't think would be that much of a hit, and when they opened it up, it started breaking box office records. And in Arizona, the Seneca Free had exclusive rights to it. So wow! Finally, after like two and a half months, uh, a week later, it finally opened up in a second theater in Tucson. Um, I'm trying to remember. Then it was the El Dorado in Tucson, but if if the the first year it, it played for for sixty straight weeks in Phoenix exclusively wow. at the Seneca Pre over a year. So if you wanted to see Star Wars the first year of its release and you lived in Phoenix, you had to see it at the Seneca Pre, which was great because it was. So the original Seneca Pre was the, the greatest theater. Oh, I am so sad. I never had, I mean, by the time I got here, it was long gone. And when and I I'm say so it was sad. the greatest theater ever built, I am telling you this while sitting here in Los Angeles where I have been to the Cinerama Dome and the Egyptian Theater and all the, the great Palace Theater, does not hold a candle to the original Seneca Pre. And for people who wanted to see this, and everybody wanted to see it because it was a sensation, if you were lucky and you timed it right, you could show up online where the line would be around the block in the Seneca Pre, where you only had to wait two hours because the, the, the next show was sold out. But most of the time when you showed up, 
the fu- that the, the two shows ahead, it would be sold out. So you'd have to wait like four and a half and five hours in line wow. to see this thing. And people, even in summer, when it was 90 degrees out, people would stand in line. And Phoenix was a small enough town that whenever you went, you would see somebody you knew standing in line. I saw my barber. It's like, oh, hey, you know. And then, you know, so creative vendors uh, would sell drinks and snow cones, would like walk up and down the lines and you'd just be standing there or sitting on the, the hot pavement for hours at a time. Um, but if, if you went with a group or another person, you develop these strategies because right next door to the Cine Capri, there used to be this uh, French restaurant called Caf Casino. So one person would wait in line while the others in the group would go to Caf Casino and, and it, it was a, like a French bistro restaurant and, and get okay. like a lemonade or a sandwich and sit in the air conditioning <laughs> for an hour and a half and then they'd come back and then let you go. So Caf Casino did a hell of a lot of business simply catering to the wow. people who had to stand in line to see Star Wars. Um, but it's amazing when, you know, when, when most blockbusters, at least pre-COVID, you know, when movie theaters are still a thing, right. you know, would open up on like 2,500 theaters nationwide. Uh, Star Wars originally opened up uh, at like 34, and one of them, was the Cine Capri. It was the only theater in all of Arizona showing this thing. If you, if you wanted to see Star Wars, you had to go to the Cine Capri. So, yeah. That's amazing you were able to get a deal like that. Yeah, I've, 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 I've never been to the uh, the rebooted Cine Capri and it's, it, its other location, but the original one had these great like golden curtains that would like open up and then they, they would, you know, uh, right. For the for even for the trailers and then the trailers would end and then they would close and it's like okay now there's the feature and they would open up again and I did they must have had some sort of like union employee who just worked the curtains I guess it it, it, it was just the, the most amazing golden curtains and the biggest screen and one of the reasons that the Cine Capri got exclusive rights to Star Wars and Phoenix is it was like one of the only theaters that had the new Dolby sound system installed. Oh. And George Lucas was like insistent, like, well, it's got to have the, you know, it's got to okay. have the right sound. So it, it, it had only opened up in a few select theaters and when it, it's opening. So, so yeah, the great Seneca Capri. It's, it's, that was a, a, like Vintage Phoenix and uh, Legend City. That was another Facebook site that I created but unlike <laughs> uh, Legend City and, and uh, Vintage Phoenix, that one sort of floundered. It didn't get the, quite the traction that I had hoped. But it, if, if you search for it on Facebook, the original Cine Capri, the greatest theater ever made or whatever, it'll have the entire listing of every film played on, on the, at the Cine Capri and, and the date oh, wow. that it listed and how many weeks it ran. So search for that. It's great uh, Great, more more trivia for you if you want to. You're a movie lover, lover like I am. All right. So, how was Don Bowles murdered back in '76 after he'd reported on land fraud schemes by local contractors? Uh, he very famously had his car bombed in front of the Hotel Clarendon. Uh, Don Bowles, a reporter for the Arizona Republic. This is a uh, very famous part of Phoenix lore. He, you know, it was yeah. it sort of developed a reputation for covering uh, corruption in Phoenix and uh, mob influence in Phoenix. And uh, yeah, the, he walked to his car one day and uh, just like in the movies, turned the ignition on and boom. And, but he, it, it, the car bomb didn't instantly kill him. He was able to hang on like just enough in the hospital. Uh, he wasn't able really to speak, but he was able to like point to a picture from investigators and finger uh, John Harvey Adamson, uh, who was convicted of right. planting the bomb, um, but in cahoots with uh, others. Uh, Max Dunlap uh, was, was uh, the name. And uh, the uh, what was the other 
James Robeson, but um, James Robeson wasn't convicted on like the main charge. He, he got he pled guilty to like a lesser charge. And one of the reasons why this sort of kept in Arizona lore um, is because the the trial went on for decades, and so there was there was never really any closure. It's like John Harvey Addison was like originally convicted, but then he got his his. Uh, uh, I'm trying to remember. It's like he agreed to testify against his cohorts, Max Dunlap and the others, for a lesser charge, and then got convicted. Um, but then his conviction was overturned. So when they tried to recharge him, he refused to testify again, like against the other guy. So it's like, okay, well, we're gonna throw the book at you now. Um, and, and then I'm not explaining this well. I, can, I can't remember the details, but if if you look it up, it's like all three kept getting their either convictions overturned and retrials, and this so this went on for like decades. So so the story sort of kept in the Phoenix lore. But again, th this happened when I was very young, and I remember it was like the only thing that all the adults could talk about. And there was one instance where uh, I, I can't, I must have been like, I don't know, how, when was this, 77? So I was like, yeah, I, was, I must have been like seven or eight years old. And I saw this guy at one of the, like, the outdoor bat, baseball batting cages wearing a shirt with a car exploding. And in my own like seven-year-old mind, I thought that, oh, this guy must have something to do with like the Don Bowles murder. Even though he, I'm sure his shirt was just like an album cover or something, you know. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, the murder of Don Bowles prompted uh, not only the staff of the Arizona Republic, but basically a lot of journalists nationwide to form what's what was called the Arizona Project, where they would spotlight uh, like local city corruption and mob influence, and there are some who say that that sort of pressure helped alleviate some of the mob influence in Phoenix, because it was it was a it, in in the early seventies. It was a town much like Kansas City that the mob was really starting to sink its talons into. And the Don Bowles murder case sort of like got them to lay off for a bit. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a car bomb in front of the Clarendon Hotel. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, nobody has ever been poisoned by a steak at Durant's. Uh, but there was sort of an urban legend, I think completely unproven, that the conspiracy to kill Don Bowles originally started over dinner at Durant's. And I think the reason this, this, I think, false rumor got started is because Jack Durant, uh, the owner of Durant's, who, uh, he, he began the steakhouse, I think, in 1950, maybe 51. It's still there on, on Central. And it is, yep. Um, people say he had mob connections, which is sort of technically true simply because he was, before he started the steakhouse, he was a pit boss at the Flamingo Hotel back in the days when it was owned by Bugsy Siegel. So technically he was an employee of Bugsy Siegel. But, it's, but when people say an employee of Bugsy Siegel, they immediately think, oh, well, he's like the right-hand guy and, and he's doing like hits and all that. It wasn't like that. He was just, he was just a pit boss at the casino. <laughs> so, as far as I know, I don't know. There, I guess they made a, a, a movie, Durant's Never Closes. That they did. I was an extra in that movie. You were. I haven't seen it. Was it any good? Um, you know, it's funny because it, it's. I always wanted the perspective of someone who hadn't seen it, who hadn't, who didn't know anything about the story, because I knew the story. And so we actually we did for the 40th anniversary of the Don Bowles bombing. We actually did an event on the rooftop of the Clarendon. And so it was like, so I knew the story and it was, it was more abstract storytelling as opposed to being verbatim. 
type things. And I, so I always, I always loved, I always would love to have heard from somebody from outside who didn't know the story, yeah. what they thought about. But no, I mean, it was the, the, I mean, it's the, like, but you know, Travis, I mean, bombing, yeah, it was, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was a simple moment in Phoenix. I mean, yeah, nothing so, else had ever happened like it. And it was incredibly dramatic. It's like, all right, it didn't kill him. He's like, he's on his deathbed in the hospital. It's like, all right, do any of these guys look at And he's like pointing because he had, he had had like a meeting, I guess with, with, uh, one of these guys, or I can't, you know, I can't remember how he knew, but it's like, he pointed out Adamson and it's like all the, the dominoes, all the evidence, you know, uh, came into play and all the dominoes, uh, lined mm -hmm. up. So it's like, yeah. Yep. Indeed. All right. Another place I miss going to. Okay, what restaurant had had a medieval themed a miniature golf course right next door? Before closing early in the 1980s, that would be Green Gables. Green Gables Golf Course, miniature golf. Um, yeah, I I remember going. I distinctly remember going to the golf that the miniature golf. Loved it. Loved it. Loved it. Um, unlike a lot of miniature golf courses, it had like a unified theme where everything was that, you know, you would put the balls through the castles and there was this great hole where it had like this drawbridge that would go up and down and you had to time it. Oh, time it. Otherwise, you had to go across or you'd... It, the, the ball would drop into this moat and you'd have to reach into the murky, filthy water to retrieve your ball. Right. <laughs> uh uh, yeah, so it, it was like the first miniature golf course that I can remember. I guess technically it was it was the second miniature golf course uh, ever made in Phoenix, and and it's it's the one that stuck around and sort of began the miniature golf craze in Arizona, which culminated in I I knew it as golf and stuff, and I guess it changed to castles and coasters today. Right. Um, but it was right next to a restaurant that was there earlier called Green Gables. And I vaguely remember going there only a couple of times. Um, and I guess I, even when I went there in the seventies, I, from what I gather, it was sort of like on its downward trend, but I guess in its heyday, people would be, you know, all the waiters and waitresses are dressed up in like knights and medieval themes and, and oh uh, yeah. And you would have the and you would have the the knight guiding you to your parking spot with his little lance pointing to your parking spot on his horse. Yeah, they had a it was, it's sitting there on a horse. Yeah, I, I, I remember yeah. that. So it was it was, it was great. <laughs> so yeah, it's one of the uh, the the great uh, famous restaurant and 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 golf courses around Green Gables. Indeed. All right, so back in 79, part of Legend City Music Park became the first amphitheater built for rock and roll concerts. What music star's father was part owner of Compton Terrace? Stevie Nicks, who performed there a couple of times from what I gather. Uh, I must say, I never went to a concert at Compton Terrace, but I remember hearing a few way in the distance when I was visit visiting Legend City. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. So, um, yeah, uh, Legend City was uh, the, this great uh, amusement park um, that, that was sort of, uh, again, it had a, like a coherent theme, a Western theme. And I grew up thinking that, well, Every big city has an amusement park. There's Disneyland, which you know the, I, I understood was the king of amusement parks. But it's like, well, every I'm sure every city has an, a big amusement park, and you know the one in Phoenix was Legend City. And I found out later, like, no, not every city has a big amusement park like this. This is you know, didn't realize how special it was. But yeah, uh, I guess Compton Terrace, which which was, uh, I guess the first big outdoor amphitheater for, for rock concerts in, in Phoenix. Um, I was built like right next to Legend City. I, th I think it, it actually bought out some of the land from Legend City. And in fact, uh, if 
I recall correctly, Legend City had its own miniature golf section that sort of got destroyed because of Compton Terrace set and took it over. So. Uh, okay. You know, one thing I love about the show is you never know the comments are going to come up. So Anita says her husband's grandfather sold Green Gables the white horse that they rode on for your parking spot. Wow. Now, when, yeah. where, which forum is this chat taking place in? Is this on the um, So um, Facebook. Facebook. All right. That, if anyone's listening in, go to the Facebook and if you have any questions or comments. Yeah. So, yeah. So it should, it should also work if you're on YouTube and Twitch as well. Wow. So did the horse have a specific name or do we know? Oh, I don't know. So um, so we'll see if, if she can find out from Mike. Maybe maybe the horse had a stage. Or, and, and then Roger says that Compton Terrace had a rotating stage. Oh, wow. So, yeah. wow. didn't I've never heard that part. Yeah, again, I was too young to go to concerts myself. And, and when I was that age, I just I wasn't into music as much as I later came in my high school years. So. Oh, he said actually it was celebrity. That's what I thought. I thought, you know, the celebrity had one. I was like, wow, there were two rotating, rotating stages. <laughs> but so, yeah, uh, Stevie Nicks dad was, was like a, the, the, the co-owner or co-creator. So. All right. So now we have, Oh, Ted was the horse's name. Ted. All right. Ted. So it was Ted the horse. Was that it Mr. Ted or just, just Ted? I think it was just Ted. All right. Let's play so, as opposed to Mr. Ed, but. Mm-hmm. All right. So, Big Surf Water Park in Tempe opened in 69. Which best describes Big Surf? It was the first amusement park to ever receive an award by the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. It was, in fact, the very first big way inland wave pool ever created in America. Not the second, the very first. And uh, Phoenix had it. Again, this is one of these things where, again, it was built in 69, which was the year I was born. And again, it was close to when the Phoenix Suns were first established. So there was, at 69, there was a lot of like new and interesting things happening in Phoenix that I was fortunate enough to take part in. And again, it was one like Legend City. It was one of these things that because I went there as a kid, I assumed that, well, every big city has a a wave park. You don't have to go to an ocean. I, I'm sure Chicago has one of these things. And, you know, San Francisco. And, oh. and when I realized, like, no, I, like how amazing it was that a phoenix of all places, the desert, you, there's a place where people can surf. And, uh, yeah, this, this, uh, um, I, boy, I, I wish I had my notes in front of me. This was like the brainchild of one guy, uh, whose name, I don't know, maybe somebody in Facebook can shout out who developed this theory and made like his, a small model in his backyard and said, well, I can just do, I can make this as big as I want and came up with this, uh, idea that became uh, Big Surf. And I have many fond memories of always hating to go to Big Surf. And I will explain what I mean by that. Uh, (laughs) um, To me, Big Surf, and I'm glad it's it's still around. I would love nothing more than to, to go to Big Surf today. I know it came very close to closing on a number of occasions. Um, but it's one of those things where it's like you, I'm sure everybody has experience of something that you had a bad, always had a bad experience with, but like years later, you still look back with fondness. That's what Big Surf was to me. I, I only went there maybe five or six times when I was very young. I, I, I think my parents took me most of the time, and the other time I think I went on a school field trip or something. Uh, and I distinctly remember that the sand was like punishingly hot; like it would like burn the soles of your feet. You know, I mean, if you weren't, you know, wearing shoes. I mean, I, I walked on there barefoot, not realizing. And of course, 
the 120 degree sun was beating down on it all day. And so it's like, oh, so you'd like quickly, right. I'd throw my, you know, towel down. Uh, I didn't have enough sense to wear at least sandals, you know. And then it's like, uh, I was always sort of, I was young enough that I was still like nervous about the concept of going into the ocean and, and it just seemed like the ocean. And then on top of that, there was this urban legend going around at that time that if you waded too far out into the deep end of Big Surf, that you would get sucked in by this by the mechanics that would create the wave and it would keep you down and drown you. So all the kids, you know, the, the kids were like, who, who weren't big enough to surf were like always scared of it. And I was one of them. Um, right. And then I was always, you know, sort of sensitive to like cold water. And so it's like the, the 120 degree sun was beating down on you, but the water was still freezing cold for some reason. So it's like I would, because it was so hot on the sand, I would like wade out to like just above my shins and sort of like splash the water to keep cool until right. like, I can't remember, like whether it was every seven minutes or every 15 minutes, the, the mechanism would create the wave and I'd be standing in like the shallow part and then all these like surfers and boogie boarders would, like come at me like, oh shit, well, I gotta get out of, you know. So I never really actually enjoyed myself uh, at Big Surf, but I love the memories and I absolutely love the concept that this amazing creation exists in of all places, the middle of the Phoenix desert. Right. Um, and then I don't distinctly remember this, but apparently, in addition to Compton Terrace, a lot of great concerts happened there. Um, yeah. Not the Who with their, in, in, but uh, with their Who's Next album, but apparently Pink Floyd played a concert there for their Dark Side of the Moon tour. Um, and how amazing would that have been? I, you know, I don't know if they put out seats or everybody just, you know, sat on the sand or whatever, but. Um, what I wouldn't give to <laughs> to go back and and see Pink Floyd, you know, on their original Dark Side of the Moon tour at Big Surf. Right. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, even though it was always an urban legend that the wave mechanism like sucked people down and drowned them, that never happened. But just because there were kids who, you know, were not adept swimmers, by like 1980, again, it was it built in 69. By 1983, I think there had been like three specific drownings, uh, you know, that people that just didn't know how to swim. And it is, it does right. recreate like the tides of an ocean water. with the, with the, yeah. So, right. uh, so no, so they were never given an award for, <laughs> by the insurance company for <laughs> avoiding fatalities. Like every big amusement park, there's some tragedies, but, um, uh, but it's it's still in a, yeah, but it was the first amusement park to be right. awarded uh, given an award by mechanical engineers and it, it's an amazing achievement. I'm glad it's still right. Working. Yeah, and it's still and it's still plugging away, still making yeah. those waves. Yeah. All right. So our last and final question, and I know you love the Sombrero Playhouse. I do indeed. All right, so it opened its doors in 47 as stage and dinner theater, and in 49, they added a screen. Which of the following statements is false? None of the above. I don't, I don't know if you need to, like, I don't know if you can go back and... and Actually, I thought of that, so there they are. Oh, there we go. See? <laughs> yes, indeed. Again, before it became a movie theater, it was a live stage theater, and uh, a bunch of celebrities performed there, including Groucho Marx and uh, Tallulah Bankhead and some of the great stars of the stage and screen. If, if they wanted to perform in Phoenix, the, the Sombrero Playhouse was like the premier theater back then. Um, and, uh, yeah. William Inge's natural natural affections that had uh, Shelley Winters in it uh, before it went on to great acclaim on Broadway got its start in Phoenix, and uh, yes, 
it was uh, one of the uh, first 20 theaters to show the Rocky Horror Picture Show at midnight. So uh, the... Uh, um, oh, wait a second. Hold on a second. Did we say all of the above? Yeah. This this is wrong. No, I'm sorry. Ah, uh, see, I was wondering because I'm like, I didn't, I mean. I, I, ah. D is in fact wrong. D is, in, D is false. I've even fooled you on this. So <laughs> it was never acquired by AMC theaters due to impending bankruptcy. And uh, that's why <laughs> it ended up <laughs> right, going bankruptcy. Question. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't know if I... I don't know if that was my mistake in communicating the answers to you or if that was it. Yeah, no, that's it. The answer is not E. The answer so is it's D. D. All right. False. It was never acquired by AMC. Uh, I'm glad, glad, glad we went back to this. I confused myself with the answer. <laughs> uh, but it was, it, it beca- you know, I started going, um, you know, long after it had closed as an actual live theater and it was strictly an art house movie theater. Uh, and that's when I first saw the Rocky Horror Picture Show. It was one of the first 20 theaters in the nation to start showing it at midnight. The Rocky Horror Picture Show, uh, it began its initial theatrical run uh, in Christown at U of A theaters. Uh, and it completely bombed. Nobody saw it. And then, like, less than a year later, it's, it's, it started at these midnight showings first in New York, and it sort of caught on. And on the West Coast, the Sombrero was one of the first theaters on the West to start showing it at midnight. Um, I was too young to see it originally at a midnight screening. My parents were the coolest parents in the world. And they would like, you know, before I could drive, they would drive me around and drop me off at friends and be willing to like pick me up at say maybe 10, 1030 at the latest. But asking them to pick me up at like 2 a.m. was a bridge too far. They wouldn't do that. (laughs) Right. So I would have to wait. The Sombrero, there was twice a year where the Sombrero would play Rocky Horror at a 9 p.m. showing. And that was Halloween Eve on October 30th. And then on June 3rd, which was the anniversary date of when they started showing it at midnight. So every Uh, year on October 30th and June 3rd, they would show the Rocky Horror Picture Show as a double bill along with Phantom of the Paradise, a movie that I introduced you to. So Phantom of the Paradise would play at 7 o'clock and then at like... 8.30 8.30 or 9, Rocky Horror Picture Show. Would, and, and then twice a year, so I would I would watch it then. Right. Uh, admission was dirt cheap. Uh, it was uh, For people my age, I think it was only a dollar, maybe $2. Wow. Um, but it was it was like the only, there was maybe one other, I think the Fox, I can't remember. But it was like one, either the only or, or one of two like art house theaters, repertory theaters that would show like, you know, films from the 60s and 70s that were right. the first on stuff. So, yeah, the Sombrero Playhouse, right? Yeah, no, I would have loved that. I mean, all the double features they did and everything else. Now, if you want to cry into your mouthwash, so basically Elton John played Big Surf in 1973, $5 a ticket. Cannot believe that. I would, I would pay $5. I mean, think about that. No ticket master, no scalping, just five bucks, take a seat in the sand. Right. And there you go. You're set. I, I don't know. I, I'd be curious to know if it was his piano in the sand or did he have like an elevated, he must have had like an elevated stage. I'm sure he was on a stage somewhere. Yeah. So, yeah. But but yeah, there were like huge acts playing a big serve. I'd be curious to know if they still had like the waves going or if they shut that off during that. I have a feeling they would have shut that off because that would have been such a huge distraction. Yeah, I know. But the it noise, cool, you know, I mean, that that thing making that push. Yeah, but at, at night, they get a full moon on the sand. You know, it's like, boy, can't be. Yeah. 
All right. So now we, we always end trivia with asking people how they did. So. Oh, and, and just going back to Big Sur. Oh, yes. Some people get this wrong. The, there, there is a, a cult surf movie called North Shore that takes place at Big Sur. In its opening scenes, but it actually was not filmed there. It was filmed in a inland wave tank in Palm Springs. Oh, that is so funny that they but the used the whole a conceit of the film is that the, the main protagonist learns to surf at Big Surf and wins like the top prize there, and then goes on thinking that he's he's like the top dog. Goes on to the actual North Shore Hawaii, and suddenly discovers like he's way in over his head. And people are looking at him like, you learned to surf in Phoenix? What, what are you talking about? So yeah, the opening scenes, it, it convinced me, based on my memories, that it was actually filmed at Big Surf, but actually, but no, it was filmed in Palm Springs, but it, they made it up to look like Big Surf. So it takes place there. Okay, that's yeah. so funny. So Justin, thank you so much for coming on and sharing stories from your childhood, from just kind of the ethos, so. Well, thank you. Oh it's my gosh, a, so fun. It's been a real pleasure. If, if, if there are viewers out there who are on Facebook, but but still not part of it, uh, look up the site Vintage Phoenix, and uh, you feel uh, uh, if you don't have a suspicious profile, then our moderators will probably approve you, but they, you know, <laughs> but Joanne, I don't know. If there's, if there's any red I mean, flags, I mean, so. but, um, but if you get, if you get rejected, you know, find me on Facebook and send me a direct message and appeal your case. We'll, we'll put you on there. But yeah, there's a, there's a lot of uh, continued history. Uh, I mean, Marshall Shore is, is, the absolute master hip historian of Arizona history, but you can still find a lot of historical tidbits on the vintage Phoenix site. So I hope you'll visit. Well, I mean, that's what I love is because it's people that are just sharing their personal stories. And so, so often it's like suddenly you find this little tidbit that never made it into the newspapers about something or so it's always connecting to something. So there's always that little side piece. It's like, Oh, it, that, that's the golden nugget right there. It amazes me like what it's grown into. And there, there, there was a, like an actual like reporter, I forget one of the TV stage, or I think of doing a podcast and she was like 30 years old. And she, I remember she like went on there and asked, can, can somebody explain to me what a Ladmo bag is? And, and, <laughs> and, and it's for, for, for the people who grew up in Phoenix, they're like, oh my God, how does the, you know, how does somebody not know what a Ladmo bag is? But it's like, we forget that Well, the show's been off for so many years. Right, and, exactly. Yeah, it, it's it's amazing. It's still amazing what that site grew into. If I could just leave you with a, with a final story about how the longer version of how that site got started. Again, I grew up in Phoenix, but I went to college in Tucson. And then, you know, the week I graduated college, I moved right out to Los Angeles where I've lived the rest of my life. So it's really, you know, my only, only my childhood and teenage years that I grew up in Phoenix. And so I sort of, you know, I would, I would visit like maybe once or twice a year around Thanksgiving or, or you know, the early spring. And so I would see sort of the, the changes, but, you know, because I wasn't living in the city day to day, Occasionally, you know, a number of years would go by where some of the radical changes that the city had undergone would sort of hit me in the face. Um, and so there was a, a, a friend of mine uh, who also grew up in Phoenix and ended up moving to Los Angeles. And he ended up posting again. Yeah, this was like maybe 12 or 13 years ago. He did a Facebook post about how he visited Christown Mall and how depressed he got because of how much it changed, you know, Chris Town used to be this vibrant thing. It was, it was like the center of social and commercial life in Phoenix during like the late seventies and early eighties, or, or, or at least, you know, shopping malls were, and then Chris Town was on, on our side of the, the city. And he's saying, man, this really depresses me. And it's sort of like, he expressed feelings that I had felt, but that hadn't expressed. I'm like, oh yeah, you know, you're right. 
So I originally started this Facebook page called the Late Great Chris Town Mall, dedicated to the way Chris Town used to be. That, so that was sort of like the first uh, uh, Facebook okay. page I created. And then I started thinking, what are some of the other things that are no longer around in Phoenix? And so I started this the Seneca Pre site and then the Legend City site. And the Legend City site on Facebook floundered for a while. It got like, you know, a couple of hundred people signed up to it. And then finally, after about a year or two years, it got to like 800 people. And this woman came on and posted a message saying, oh, this site's great. My dad would, would love this site. He created Legend City. And it's like my eyes, are, because it's like, I had always thought that Legend City was just sort of something that was thought of by some sort of faceless corporate conglomerate. It never occurred to me that like Disneyland from Walt Disney, right. Legend it City was there. the brainchild of like one guy, Lewis Crandall. Yeah. And not only that, Janie Crandall said, well, he's still alive. I'm going to tell him about it. And all of a sudden, there he is on Facebook. It's like, oh, hey, this is great. And so it's like, People imagine being able to talk to Walt Disney about what it was like to create Disneyland. People were able to like ask him questions on Facebook. And it's like this, it, it, it's like this guy was like a, a crazy visionary for like visiting Disneyland and just saying, uh, you know what? Phoenix ought to have a place like that and going ahead and, and like building it out of, you know, um, and I think that that site is what ended up uh, sort of leading up to like the 50th anniversary party that they had or, or right. reunion party, you know. Right. And, and, and when I first created the, fa the, the Legend City Facebook site, I, if I'm going on too long and need to cut, cut this off, let me know. But um, I was like looking around the Internet for like pictures to post on the Facebook site and couldn't really find anything except for one website on the corner of the internet uh, by this guy, uh, John Buker, who had, had, was like the only site on the regular internet off of, off of social media that had remembered Legend City and had a bunch of photos on it. And I basically just ended up stealing stuff off of his site, it, you know, copying and pasting the photos like, you know, um, and eventually, uh, you know, I, I, I spoke to John about it and I apologized and made him like the, the administrator of the site. So he, he more or less runs it now, along with members of the Crandall family. Right. Um, be, because it's just like, you know, I needed some sort of photo <laughs> to, to do the Facebook site. And John was, was the only one who cared enough to remember uh, you know, again, this is 12 or 13 years ago. Um, right. So a lot of, you know, Phoenix history uh, owes a tip of the hat to, to John Buchner as well. So and then, and then again, like I said, after the Crandalls got involved to, with the Facebook site, it started gathering like thousands of people and they started posting their memories of stuff of, of Phoenix memories that had nothing to do with Legend City. And if you know how Facebook operates on the timeline, it, it eventually got to a point where you'd have to scroll down like 30 posts for like a full two minutes before you'd actually get to something about Legend City on the Legend City site. They were talking about other stuff about Phoenix. So right. finally, you know, the, I, I asked the Crandalls, it's like, are you okay with this? And they were diplomatic saying that, well, they didn't want to make any waves, but it's like they would prefer that the Legend City Facebook site be dedicated strictly to Legend City. It's like, you're right. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to create this other site. Uh, and I modeled it after uh, a site I was familiar with on Facebook called Vintage Los Angeles. That was, you know, had a whole bunch of stuff about Los Angeles, primarily from the 50s to the 80s. I was like, all right, we're going to call it Vintage Phoenix. Everything that's not Legend City related on the Legend City site. I'm just going to delete and gravitate over here. And the initial few weeks, there was a lot of hatred. It's like, how dare you delete my discussion on the Legend City site? Um, there were a lot of curse words uh, thrown at me then. But 
people understood eventually why I did it. And then, like I said, these, these other people, most of whom I've never met or even spoken to, said, hey, this is great. I'll help administer the site for you and keep the, the spam off. And, and now, again, almost 10 years later, September 17th will be our 10-year anniversary for my creating it. Well, it's over 50,000 people. It's a great resource for, for Phoenix history and a lot of memories and right. links to videos and photos. And so it was just all a lark from the fact that one of my friends originally said that, boy, you know, Christown Mall isn't what it used to be. <laughs> So, so that's that's the story behind the Vintage Phoenix Facebook site. Cool. I didn't I didn't realize the progression of where where it all happened. So that's yeah. actually cool to hear about how it all got there. Yeah. No, so, so, like I said, I you know I've lived the last thirty years in Los Angeles. I've only spent the first twenty in Arizona. So, I mean, it's it's sort of like the last guy who should have been creating it. But at the same time, and I think you can relate to this since you were not born and bred in Phoenix. Exactly. Um, there is an advantage for being something of an outsider when looking at history. Right. Um, and I'm sort of like a hybrid because I, I distinctly remember, you know, the, the 70s and 80s. But in terms of the 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 very vast and profound changes that the city has gone through, um, especially the last 20 years, but really even get started through the 90s. It's something that I've sort of like observed in dribs and drabs from just, you know, two or three weekend visits a year uh, or from afar, you know, <laughs> watching other people. It's, it, 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 it's sort of like, oh, I haven't been to, you know, Metro Center in like 10 years. It'd be great to visit. Oh, what do you mean it's not there anymore? Oh, wow. It, 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 they're turning, tearing it down. It's, you know, um, it, right. so it's a very different perspective when you're in the middle of it, living through the changes, the incremental changes day to day. You know, you don't necessarily appreciate it versus when you're only, you know, you're getting smacked in the face with it once every two years. It's like, what do you mean Appetitos isn't there anymore? It, it, that was like the best some sandwich place around, you know. <laughs> so it's, uh, it, it's, it's been an interesting ride, um, sort of observing the changes of the city from, afar, you know, not terribly from afar, from like on the East Coast, right. I mean, but from several hundred miles away. Right. So. <laughs> but uh, no, it's, this has been a, a, a great pleasure. I, I absolutely... Um, Love your Arizona history happy hour as, as well as, as uh, everything uh, you bring around town in, in, in Phoenix as a historian. I know you're always involved in always trying to keep bingo or, or, yeah. or presentations. I know. It's, it's <laughs> I know. Looking forward to cool weather so we can go back to the Clarendon and do some rooftop bingo. Cheers to that. Well, Indeed. Yeah. I agree. I miss that so much. So, All right, Justin. So thank you, and I, I hope this has been uh, I hope this has been fun and educational. I've had a blast. I, I and I see by the comments other people have had fun as well. So there you go. People had fun and they learned. Oh awesome. darn! Well, exactly. if, if you're on the the vintage Phoenix site, you can now put a, a face to the name. So. Justin, again, thank you so much. Thank you, Marshall. Have a great rest of your night. Good to see you, sir. You and well. too. All right. Ah, that was so much fun. You know, I really enjoyed hearing also about how the whole Vintage Phoenix thing even got started. So see, now when I first said, you know, you probably should share, now you know why, because you get to learn about all kinds of things that you didn't expect to learn. And have fun while you're doing it. So now we get time for show, show and tell. So I have a house full of stuff. And so since we were talking about the high school band, I was like, you know, high school. So I have a penchant for yearbooks. And so this is the 1950 The Westerner, which is for 
Somebody's going to beat me to it. West Phoenix High School, which was at 19th Avenue and Thomas, where Metro Center is today. And so one of the things I love is just because, I mean, A, you've got all the, the different clubs and all different people, but old yearbooks were such a chronicle of also what was going on around town. So, I mean, it's like you have different ads. I mean, here's, I mean, here we have OS Stapley. Although it doesn't have an address, I'm wondering if it's the one on Grand. I don't know when that one closed. And then you have like Cool Radio, Western Savings, Encanto Pharmacy over at 15th Avenue and Thomas with even a photo of what the building looked like back then. Stewart Motor Company. So yeah, so I mean, that's one of the things I love about old yearbooks is just the different ads and things. I mean, you've got Porter's. I mean, you've got Phoenix College because what else would you be pitching to high school students other than, hey, come to local community college and you might want to go get yourself a new suit at Hanny's. So, all right, everybody. So as we move on, so next week we have Nikki D'Andrea. So, you know, there's probably going to be some sports stuff. I bet there'll be some place stuff. So kind of a lot of fun stuff. Um, she's been a writer for Phoenix New Times. I think even editor of at one point. I know she was with New Times for a while. So she has a lot of great stories to bring. So she will be our guest next week. So I look forward to seeing you same bat time, seven o'clock on Thursday evenings. And so remember, if you have any questions, please feel free to share. Um, and please reach out to me if you didn't get a chance to say something that you're like, oh man, I wanted to say that. So please reach out on Facebook, Instagram, email. I love to hear from folks. Again, that's actually where some of my best stuff comes from is just sitting around chatting with folks and getting a different side of the story. So I always want to give a shout out to Cole and Chris who created that amazing video at the intro, as well as PJ, even though he is now across the water in Puerto Rico. Again, thank you so much. And as we are in kind of a, I would say a season where people are having lots of allergies because there's lots of things now blooming. So I am going to leave you with a Dristan commercial from 1960. So everyone have a great rest of your evening and I will see you next week. When hay fever pollen invades your sinuses, brings runny nose, watery eyes, take Dristan. Dristan's like sending your sinuses to Arizona. Yes, Dristan's like sending your sinuses to Arizona. That is, Dristan helps you breathe free and easy, as if you were far away from pollen or allergy irritation. Yes, Dristan's like sending your sinuses to Arizona. Helps dry, runny nose, itchy, watery eyes. You see, Dristan tablets shrink swollen, congested nasal and sinus passages, which cause runny nose and watery eyes. So you breathe free and easy fast. So when pollen invades your sinuses, causing hay fever miseries, don't wish you could be in sunny, dry Arizona. Just remember, Dristan's like sending your sinuses to Arizona. Get Dristan decongestant tablets.